it does take a little bit of extra mental space to take a pause and consider how you want to feel as you move through life, how you want other people to feel as they interact with you. However, it doesn't take any more action. Being intentional about how we show up is about just taking that pause and saying, what do I want to come of this moment? What is it that I want from this moment? And not only just thinking about it, but then vocalizing it to the people around you and continually setting those expectations and sharing those intentions, which is a deeply vulnerable thing. So it does take practice, right? And to learn to listen to our own voices. But ultimately what I find is that being intentional actually helps us to do less, right? And to stop saying yes to things we don't actually want to do and start feeling empowered to say no to the things we don't want to do so that we can show up better in the ways and things that we actually do want to do and be invested in. And so it's really talking about intention is about how we're investing ourselves and our energy and our time. What do we want to be investing it in and how? Um, and it's deeply important that we get curious. Definitely Google something in the world today and every day that you think you know everything you need to know about just so that you can learn something new about it. And you'll start to absolutely recognize the ways in which everything around you is beautiful and valuable. The Tom Screen podcast is owned and made possible by Ethical Marketing Service. If your business is struggling with Google or Facebook ads, maybe you're frustrated figuring it out or there's a performance issue, Ethical Marketing Service has worked on hundreds of accounts and we can help in this area. We offer a 30 day money back guarantee. If you would like to find out if we can help, it's a free, no salesy consultation call and the link is in the description. Enjoy the episode. Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the episode today, we have Shana Francesca. Shana, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Thomas. It is very much my pleasure. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a scholar of intentional and ethical leadership and living. I'm a keynote speaker. I facilitate workshops and consult on what is it to be an intentional and ethical human and an intentional and ethical leader. Um, and uh, background wise, I grew up in an evangelical Christian cult and inside an abusive household. And uh, I, I, it's very clear to me now looking back that curiosity is what saved my life and ultimately what led me to my work and understanding how do we recognize what, that we are human, how do we remember that we are nature, and how do we live in reciprocity with the living world? The very interesting introduction, and um, you touched upon a lot of things which I am interested in. So uh, you have an interested interest in ethics, which my company yeah. name is, uh, you know, I, I put that in there because I have an interest in it. And then also yeah. um, around your story. So um yeah, I've got loads of questions, but would you like to yeah. start with um, a little bit about your story and uh, just so, you know, anything you're comfortable with that you'd, you'd be interested in sharing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I was, like I said before, I was uh, born into an abusive household and then raised in an evangelical Christian cult. And the thing about growing up in um, extreme, I, I see those environments as simply extreme versions of the one that everybody lives in um, because I see so much that is unethical and exploitative about our world. Um, but growing up in the environments that I did, there was absolutely no space for me to be who I was. I was punished for being myself. I was um, constantly threatened with the concept and the idea of being sent to hell um, but also I lived in hell. Um, so I wasn't really sure how much hell could be worse than the, than what I was living in at the time. Um, and when you, when you have parents who are unhealthy, the thing is they don't exactly surround themselves with healthy people. So your entire world is now encompassed with unhealthy, abusive people, typically, right? There might be a couple of people who shine through that and they did, right? It was mostly teachers throughout my life who, seemed to see me and recognize my curiosity and not punish me for it, but embrace who I was. Um, but 
growing up in an environment where you're punished for being yourself, for asking questions, for daring to be curious, um, it, it primes you to be exploited and harmed by abusive people throughout your life, right? And so it's deeply important that you connect to healing. And I'm so thankful that I did. It took me a really long time and I'll probably be on that healing journey for the rest of my life. Um, but to me, it's no shock that I ended up recognizing that I grew up in an intentionally harmful environment and in deeply unethical environment. And that my curiosity led me to a place to ask, well, what is it then to be ethical? What is it then to be human? Because I wasn't raised to be human. I wasn't raised to recognize I am nature. I wasn't raised to recognize that I belong existing within an ecosystem, which National Geographic defines essentially as a bubble of life. I didn't grow up in a bubble of life, right? I grew up in in an environment where I was colonized, where um, I was used and um, and raised to believe that that was what I existed for. Um, but I don't think any of us really, I, I, I haven't met a single person um, who was ever truly raised to be human, um, especially in the, here in the United States. Um, we were raised to survive within capitalism, right? And those are two very different things. Um, survival is very different than, than a existence and a thriving existence. Um, and so, yeah, that background led me to where I am, where, um, and somewhere in the middle, I went to school to be an interior designer, um, recognizing that people primarily didn't feel like they had the permission to take up space authentically, even within their own homes. Um, and I wanted to be able to craft that environment to be the mirror that people chose to be able to show them who I saw them as and to not create their home aligned with trends, but for it to be aligned with how they wanted to show up in the world, the story they wanted their life to tell, creating very intentional environments. And then it was a client of mine who said, and I'd already been doing like group coaching for, for leaders, for entrepreneurs, for people from the age of like 25 to 55, almost 60. Um, around these concepts that I was applying in my interior design, but I, I recognized were valuable outside of it, that they were just valuable for human beings in general. And one of my clients was like, you need to do something more with that. Um, because I think they recognized that the medium, that I was using interior design as the medium to have these conversations and that that medium in and of itself was limiting and that I had a powerful voice and I should probably use it in more profound ways. And so, you know, that began the shift from focusing on interior design work to um, really leaning into my scholarly work. Thank you for that. Um, lots to follow up on, uh, including uh, the, the your, your going to hell if you don't do X thing. Uh, it, it reminds me of like, do as I say, all bad things will happen. It's just another way of saying that, right? It's the same thing. Yeah. So at church, it was do as you're told, do as I say, and how I interpret the Bible. And no discussion of the relevance and the massive reinterpretations, interpretations of the Bible and who put it together in the first place and so on and so forth. It was just do as I say, we're going to hell. And at home, it was do as I say, or you will be harmed. Hmm. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to follow up on was the... Um... Was it a uh, what people perceive to be a religion that was behaving as though it's a cult, or was it um, what people might label as a cult? So, how was the label of um, what you were brought up in? Um, religion behaving as an as as a cult. Um, to me, uh, any organization that asks for your unquestioning, um, I don't even wanna call it faith, but to me, there's even a sinister aspect in the way that religion co-ops faith because faith doesn't require explanation. It doesn't require proof. Would you refer so to I, it as compliance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unquestioning compliance, that would be a, a great word. Thank you. Um, Anybody that's asking for that, that isn't willing to, or any organization that's asking for that is absolutely 
in their next breath going to be perpetrating harm? Because there's no accountability in that, right? And to me, the basis, uh, the basis of my work to understand what it is, the place that I've gotten to, and I'm sure this will morph and change as I continue my work, but the place I'm at now and that I recognize is that the foundation of what it is to be intentional and ethical, intentionally good, right? And, and, re- and live in reciprocity with the world around us is curiosity, respect, and accountability. And I truly fundamentally believe that there is no relationship without those things, but ultimately, definitely without accountability, there is no relationship because if you're not curious about the impact of your actions on the people around you, um, then you fundamentally do not respect them um, and do not actually care about them. So accountability to me is that necessary ingredient. All of them are, but that, that, that last one, accountability is truly deeply powerful when we talk about how we show up in the world. I would like to um, follow up with you about accountability. Um, although I, I wasn't sure when, because I looked at your profile and everything, I yeah. wasn't sure whether it was accountability in the context of, I don't know, performance wise um, or uh, keeping people in check, which is kind of a, my interpret- interpretation of your last answer. Question I wanted to ask in regards to the your upbringing and um you know how you stumbled into into ethics essentially is is there a point in which you realize that you're not being treated ethically or fairly um because the reason why i ask that is the reason i have an interest in ethics in philosophy is because i was confused about um what the right thing to do was and wasn't necessarily I didn't feel like I was seeing it in my everyday life so I had this massive interest in knowing I understand that it's not quite as clear as that now but um, that was the reason why I'm interested in the topic because I wanted to know about what the right thing to do is is there a, a point in which you realize that that's what's driving you to answer the first part of her question did I at any point realize that I was being treated unfairly and unethically yes from the very beginning. I probably was three or four when I realized, all right, trigger warning for anybody who's listening. Um, I, we're gonna dive into some really sensitive topics around abuse and sexual assault. So please be careful and fast forward if those are topics that are too sensitive for you to engage in at this moment. Um, the first time I was sexually assaulted, I was, I was raped, I was three years old. And so, crashes into you the realization um, that men will use your body to emotionally regulate themselves and that that is fundamentally harmful, right? I didn't have that language back then, but I felt it and I knew it because the boy who raped me, his father was abusive and a drunk violent, uh, an alcoholic and, and a violent person who probably his father had experienced some very traumatic, terrible things as well. And so to recognize that you become your body, not because you're not recognized as a person, especially inside of evangelical Christianity, women serve one purpose, that is to be a wife and to be a mother, to be a breeder. And your personhood does not, is not valuable. It doesn't even exist. You exist as um, as an object, as a complement, as an arm candy, as an extension of someone else. Um, and so, yeah, fundamentally, I knew from the beginning that that was unfair. I felt it and I spoke it and I felt like I was screaming it inside of my head all the time, but I knew I wasn't safe to say it out loud. And then at the age of 12, I was forced to take a chastity pledge, which was further traumatizing because the concept of virginity, which I do, am not invested in, um, I, I don't believe it's a real thing, um, was then violated, right? Because I'd been raped. I wasn't technically a virgin, but then I was supposed to declare in front of 2000 people that I was, and I was going to hold this thing as sacred when it hadn't been held sacred, not by me, but by someone else, right? And so there was this fundamental contradiction um happening there and also at the same time my father was grooming me because the second time I was sexually assaulted I was 15 and it was by my father 
So when I say that the reality of our world being deeply unethical absolutely pierced my world from my earliest recognition, that is my reality. There was no, there was, there was no uh, like gray area. I knew that I was not valued at the same level that men were, period, right? And I knew that to be fundamentally unethical. I, again, I didn't have that language, but I can look back and I have my journals from then, um, not from when I was three, but I started journaling when I was like six or seven um, and see how much I raged against the world around me, but was not safe to do it in any other way than inside of a journal. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? Can you remind me? Uh, I was I was deep into listening to you then. So um, I know. I'm sorry. So I've, I was I've, deep I've into now answering your question. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, but I do have, uh, firstly, I want to say, um, I, I feel a, a lot of empathy for you. And I'm very sorry that you had to go through that at such a, well, at any time, but especially at such a, an important age in your development. Um, I don't know why this comes to me, but I, I kind of, I, it's probably because I'm a dad to daughters as well. Um, I, I kind of want to ask about, there's two part question. Um, were you particularly upset or angry at someone in particular and so i'm thinking like where is the dad in this picture and why aren't you being protected um but then the the second part uh is around if someone else is going through the same thing so um because yeah. what my my interpretation is that you've done a lot of work in um recovering or perhaps helping yourself through this trauma and um, what advice you would give them? I would say um, you definitely need support. You need community around you. And for a long time, I didn't have that. So it took me a really long time to let go of the rage because I was so alone in all of it. The community I was raised in was deeply unhealthy. And even though I made aware of the pastoral staff at the church slash cult that I grew up in, they absolutely hit it even though their mandated reporters did not report it. These are also other men, right? Um, when I say that I am not invested in purity culture or the idea of virginity, there is a very specific reason. And it is because I believe that it fundamentally leads to pedophilia. The glorification of innocence, which is what glorification of this untouched, virgin flesh is what it's seen as right no longer is that human seen as a person they're seen as a representation of ideology which is fundamentally dehumanizing and objectifying and so that is how my father was able to not be my father and be um a predator in my life is because he had invested in this ideology now my father was a deeply not okay person before then and he definitely needed help all along the way and refused to get it um and he is absolutely responsible for the fact that as an adult man he never took responsibility for his mental health and he because of that he was drawn to very harmful ideology. And at the same time, I can still see and understand why and how he ended up there, right? And this again comes back to why I do my work because I don't think very, I think very few people wake up in the morning and think, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna hurt the world, right? There are some people who think that way, but I don't think it's the majority of people. I think the majority of people, wake up and think they're good people and or they want to make good impressions on the world around them they want to do good things they want to be known they want to be seen they want to be heard they want to be understood right these are the things i think live with people on a day-to-day -day basis i don't think most people want to believe that they harm others but when we come to the place and recognize that something that is beneficial to one group of people or one person can be <clears throat> absolutely harmful to another 
And we have to live in that space all the time and, and be willing to understand the impact of our actions on the people, the living world that it, that it has an impact on. And we have to listen to their voices and hear them out. Um, you know, it, it becomes harder for us to just slide down these very slippery slopes that wouldn't be so slippery if accountability was there. Accountability becomes the bumps in the road that keep us from going down these very harmful paths and they're necessary. And it's necessary to recognize that being human, being alive is uncomfortable and that we have to be willing to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's what being accountable and living in accountability is, is living with and normalizing a level of discomfort that comes from, from being willing to and actively seeking to understand our impact. And because I know my father wasn't any of those things and neither was any of the leadership around him, it consistently sped up his harmful behavior. It, 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 it sped up his descent into horrific behavior. Um, and so again, I know that that's why it has led me to where I am is because I can see, I can see how easy it is for people who think themselves to be good people to perpetrate, uphold harm and systems of harm um, when there is not accountability baked into and invested in, in our lives. Do you think there is such a thing as a good person? No, I don't think there's any such thing as good or bad people. I think it's a binary that serves to uphold systems of oppression. I think it's so easy for us to say, that's a good person, I'm sure they didn't mean harm. And someone else to diminish our pain, someone else to keep us from being able to hold others accountable to normalize harm. When we recognize that there's no such thing as good and bad people, but simply people who perpetuate harm or take accountability for it um, consistently, um, I think it becomes a different conversation because then we're living in the gray and we're recognizing that we can't just put ourselves in into a category of I'm a good person. Because again, I don't think most people would put themselves in a category of bad person, right? Um, and at any given moment, we're oscillating between harm and not harm, right? Um, which is, uh, again, like if, I, if we had had this conversation and I didn't warn people that this is the conversation we're going to have, that could have harmed someone, right? The conversation isn't fundamentally bad but the impact it would have on that person could be harmful, right? And so this conversation is valuable to people who are ready and able to hear it. But for those people that it's too sensitive a topic, that would be harmful. But this conversation isn't fundamentally good or bad. It's a conversation, right? It's about recognizing and respecting people's right to choose. It's about consent, ultimately, right? And it's about... Um, making sure that we're setting expectations and that we, are, um, that we are communicating with the world around us in a way that honors and respects the way that they want to show up in the world and not just the way that we wanna show up in the world. Uh, um, you did answer one of my previous questions in that question, so I did notice, thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> um, one, uh, one follow up, if I may, if a, if a young person came to you uh, in a similar position uh, with a similar experience that you had and needed some advice or help to get out of it, what would you tell them? I would say therapy. And I would say, be careful of the therapist that you work with because all therapists work with trauma, but not all therapists are familiar with and, and recognize complex PTSD and how to address it. Talk therapy can be very harmful to people who have complex PTSD, which I do, um, because it can put you in a space of reliving that trauma. It doesn't mean you can never talk about it because obviously I'm talking about it here. It just means that there are therapeutic modalities that are probably more important for you to be invested in um, before you're able to safely talk about the thing without re-traumatizing yourself. Um, and, you know, uh, EMDR, that there's a whole, there's a whole slew of different practices that are beneficial that I would say, take a look at those. Um, 
but but definitely therapy. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to be in therapy for the rest of your life. And it also doesn't mean you don't have to be. <laughs> it just depends on what's meant for you. There's also a lot of books that I've relied on. And I have surrounded myself with people who I'm safe. My story is safe with, right? They're not interested in um, making me relive it. They're not interested in um, the entertainment of it. They're not interested or the intent or in any entertainment value they're not interested in sympathy right they're not interested in being like poor you um but instead recognize that it has made me who i am and they honor and value who i am and so they honor and value my story and they hold space for it the way that they hold space for me and it's important to find the people that you and your story are safe with and people will not weaponize it against you or or have it be the thing that comes ahead of you, right? They're not telling your story for you. They're not telling the intimate parts of your life to other people. Um, they're, they're, they're honoring that it's your story to tell. So there's a, there's a variety of things going on at the same time. I would say, find people that you are safe with. And I know that's harder to say than, I know, I know it's hard to do, right? It's easy for me to say that. And it took me a really long time. So I recognize how hard it is. Um, but going to therapy can be a first step or finding um, support groups or, um, you know, just find a Facebook group, and what it, depending on what you have access to and resources for, right? Um, but, but get yourself around people, go to the library, check out a few books. My grandmother's hands is a good one. Um, uh, hold on, there's one other one that I highly recommend. Um, there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Don't read it. People will recommend it to you, but it is deeply re-traumatizing. Um, uh, gosh, I wish I could remember the name. It's something close to that. Like, um, Also, Trauma and Recovery is a good one. Um, if I remember the book, I'll have to let you know, but I cannot remember the name of it. Um, oh, The Body is Not an Apology. Um, is another really good book. Um, but there's one specifically, uh, but just to, to seek out books that are specifically written typically by, I would encourage you to, to read books written by women around this topic um, because they're gonna be much kinder typically and they're going to recognize the, the very inherent trauma in being a woman in this world way more than a man would. Um, and I'm not saying no men do. I'm just saying that it is typically almost impossible for a man to understand what it is to be a woman in this world, unless they're, you know, someone who's invested in that work. So definitely seek out books and learning and, um, and be kind to yourself. It's going to take a while. Thank you for that. Um, you raised something which I think is important to touch on, and uh, it was around having the right peer group and the people who are going to treat you in, uh, I don't know if the, you'd phrase it this way, but the way you need or want to be treated. And I would imagine if you've ever shared your story with people, there is definitely a wrong way to respond to it. And I would imagine you already know what those are, but have you got any advice or thoughts perhaps on if someone is in that position of someone who's opening up to them about some kind of trauma, what is perhaps a right and a wrong way to go about talking to them about it? You have, to, when someone shares your story, their story with you, you have to be willing to sit with the uncomfortable feelings that are going to happen for you as the person hearing it. You also have to be kind to yourself. And if you're not prepared to take on the, that story, it's okay for you to say, I'm not sure that I'm ready to hear this story. And I wish I was, and I honor that this is your story, but I'm not sure that I can take this on. Because sometimes someone is trauma dumping, especially when they're early on in their healing process and they need to be able to just spew it all out because they haven't been able to share it with anyone. But that doesn't mean you're in the space to be able to take that on. Um, if you are, be willing to sit with the discomfort of it and you cannot make it better, so don't try. But you can hold space for their pain. You can hold space for them to 
for whatever comes up for them and don't try to make it better, right? Like that's not your responsibility and you can't. Um, and so to just be able to say, thank you for sharing your story with me. I, I can't imagine what that felt like for you. And I'm so glad that I can be here to support you in your life now, right? Like there are very kind and compassionate things that you can say um, that are very human responses and go with those, go with those. Because the discomfort part of you is gonna wanna like make it all better or like ignore how painful that, the, the depth of pain that person has gone through like and kind of glaze past it and move forward in the conversation. But to just sit there and look that person in the face and hold their hand, like even without saying a word, just holding space for that, like in that way can be so profoundly powerful. Um, so it's not about doing, right? It's more about just being with the person. Great advice. Thank you. Um... I know uh, the phrase um, good parent might be a, a little bit, uh, might be perhaps a, a fallacy in some sense, but yeah. if there was a quote unquote good parent who had a perhaps either rational or irrational fa fear, depending on how you look at it, around um, their children being involved in some sort of religious community, should we say, have you got any advice in, in that area at all? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to teenagers, <laughs> the more you tell them no, the more they're gonna wanna do something. What I think is important is to ask great questions, not self-serving questions, but great questions. When they might attend with a friend or something like that, and they come back and tell you about it, listen, hear them out. Hear what they're connecting to in that environment because it's clearly something they're feeling like they're missing in their life um, in some way, shape or form. And that will be a clue into how to connect with them and maybe prevent them from being further sucked in. Um, but asking great questions rather than making bold statements or accusations is really necessary, which is why part of my work is investing in curiosity, right? Because it is a an important way of connecting to other people. Um, and I can't tell you exactly what those questions are going to be, um, but you need to ask them with kindness and with care. And you also need to be willing to ask the really difficult questions um, in connection with your relationship with your child. In what ways do they wish that you were showing up for them that you're not? And that doesn't mean you're capable of showing up in that way but it does mean you can direct them towards communities of people who are healthier or mentor or something that, or someone um, that, that helps to fill that gap that isn't exploitative, right? An aunt, an uncle, uh, somebody that's safe and trusted, right? Um, you know, to provide community for them because ultimately what they're seeking is community. And ultimately our, light, our world is not in general set up in a communal way. It's set up in this nuclear family, very strange. It didn't, it wasn't always like that. People raised children in community with one another. They had a community of support. It wasn't two parents expected to take on the, the, the burden of raising even one other human being is a lot, right? Because there's only so many ways that you and your significant other, you know, you and the other parent, uh, and, and for those people as a single parent, I, I can't imagine what that's like. Um, you know, to try to be everything to a, another human being, try to figuring out who they are in the world, right? Like that takes a lot of input from a lot of people. Um, and so ultimately, I think it's important that we um, find safe community, whether that be like team sports or, you know, the local community center or the library or whatever it is that your child gravitates toward, towards helping them to find the community where they feel seen, heard and understood. And you might not understand that, at, you know, the community that they choose, but as long as it's a safe and healthy environment, um, I think that helps to keep people out of uh, harmful religious environments. Um, because ultimately, 
there's a lot of people that I know that are still inside of that environment simply because they, they want the community and they don't know how to find it elsewhere. So that's where we as a global people have to start building community. We have to stop investing in hyper-individualization in the concepts of nuclear families, in, in, in investing in the idea that we have to do or be it all, otherwise we're not worthy. You are worthy simply because you exist, period. You don't have to prove your value to anyone. The concept of proving your value only serves people looking to exploit you, right? Um, and, and, to, and to pay you as little as possible <laughs> to benefit from your labor. So it's deeply important that, that, that we as adults in this world, right? Um, because I'm deep, I don't have any children. I don't want to have children. I don't want to get married. Um, probably in part because of religious trauma, but mostly because I really love my work. And I know that as a woman in this world, I would be expected to forfeit my work in order to serve a husband and a child or children. Um, but it's, so I say to all parents, and, but I'm very deeply invested in my nieces' lives, right? I'm, I'm this other person that they can come to and spend time with and be with and ask the weird questions that they don't know if they can ask their parents, right? It's it deeply important that we as adults um, recognize that, recognize all that we've spoken about here and, and be invested in um, being community for people raising children all around us and for the children, right? And, and be a part of their lives um, and invested in their, in their curiosity. Well, thank you for the advice. Um, and I think that the, the point around not telling but asking questions is uh, a very good reminder. So thank you. Um, one more point, if I may, because you mentioned your expertise, and I do want to get into into that. Um, it's just a, a around the concept of family staying in touch with the family when um, abuse has taken place and your thoughts on that because my um, should we say attempted philosophical take is that if someone's willing to do that to you it doesn't necessarily matter what uh, where they are in your family line you have the the right to essentially cut them off from your life but right. I just want to know what your thoughts are and um, yeah. what perhaps you would encourage others to do uh, first I agree with you wholeheartedly um, I think it was Maya Angelou that said when someone tells you who you are who they are you should believe them and when they show you who they are, you should absolutely believe them. Just because someone is your blood relation or has done things to help you survive in this world doesn't mean you owe them anything. There are many parents, unfortunately, who have invested in this concept that because you paid you know, provided a house and food and clothing and shelter for a child, whether yours or, you know, some relation or foster or adopted, um, that they owe you some kind of loyalty and they do not. You providing food, shelter, education, medicine, all of the basic necessities is what's minimally required when, when you choose to take on and bring life into this world. They don't owe you anything for that. Um, a long time for a long time, I was manipulated into thinking that meant I owed my parents loyalty, even though they were causing me great harm. And I went no contact with my father permanently um, for, you know, uh, probably the last decade. Before that, it was low contact he wasn't really allowed to contact me but he kept violating that and so it, I went full no contact he didn't he didn't really understand um and I didn't really understand that I had the right to cut him out at, without any explanation because he knew I don't I don't have to explain to him why he's harmful to me um I went low contact and at times no contact with my mom now my mom has over the years gone to therapy and gotten help and dramatically shifted who she is. Is there still conflict in our relationship? Yes. Um, 
she's my mom. <laughs> um, and she did some really terrible things, but she has ultimately taken responsibility for those things. And although she hasn't truly investigated the root of those things, like where they came from, she does understand that they were harmful and has taken um, accountability in a variety of ways. Um, and so she is a part of my life. I have gone no or low contact with several of my uh, siblings for a variety of reasons. When you grow up in a traumatic environment together, there's going to be a lot of trauma and a lot of conflict there. And ultimately, when you're in your own healing journey, you may not be able to take on other people's reactions and their ways of being as a result of their own trauma. And it's way too re-traumatizing or additionally traumatizing to be interacting with people who are also traumatized. Um, and so it is absolutely necessary for you to trust your intuition. And if every time you are even thinking about being near a specific person, if it causes your whole body to tighten and you not to breathe, be able to breathe and your heart to race or any of these very telltale signs that you don't feel safe with someone, then please trust it. You do not owe anyone an explanation, specifically that person, because if that person continually tells you, you owe them an explanation as to why you're not going to show up or be there. They're doing so in an effort to manipulate you. They know exactly why you're uncomfortable with them. Don't let them make you think otherwise. They know. They absolutely know. Otherwise, they're a sociopath, and that's a whole other conversation. But human beings know when we harm someone else, and we're hoping they'll let us off the hook. So anyone who is deeply invested in pretending like they don't understand your pain that they've caused is not someone you're safe with. You don't owe them an explanation or even a response. You just get to not show up. And your silence will be a clear message to them. Um, and, and if they get help, that's on them. It's not on you. Um, so yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree that you should listen to your intuition when you are not safe around someone, just don't be around them. Thank you for that. It's a great answer. And um, you touched on what you're doing now. Um, by just uh, my perception is that as a result of what you've been through, you've thought a great deal about uh, the right and wrong, if you would even frame it that way. Um, and you got expertise in, in a particular area. Um, when do you I don't know if you'd refer to it as going into business, but um, when does that happen? And um, how do you realize that you can help people as a result of uh, the adversity that you've been through? Oh, gosh, I, er I realized really young that I was the person that people came to when their life was on fire, when when they had something, they had done something or interacted with someone in a way that they were deeply embarrassed by or didn't understand why they engaged in it. Um, you know, I'm the friend that people call or the person that people call when they, when like, you know, they, they did something at work. Like I had a, I had someone I know that, um, she would, she would reach out and, you know, for my counsel, um, the one time she was at a work event and she got blackout drunk and she didn't know exactly what happened. And she didn't know how to take accountability for what she didn't even know if she did. She did remember a few things and they were deeply embarrassing. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I recognized early on in my early 20s that I was the person that people felt safe with the things that they wouldn't tell their regular friends because they didn't want their friends' view of them to shift. I was this safe harbor for people. Can I ask why that is? Oh, because people could sense my trauma. I, I think as human beings, we can tell when someone else has gone through something. Um, random strangers in grocery stores since I was a kid would tell me their stories. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I honestly, it, it would be a great question to poll all the random people who have told me their life stories and be like, why, why did you? But I think it's because I'm not afraid to see people. And I think people can see that I see them. And I, because I, I look at them and I'm not staring at them. I'm not judging them. I'm just taking in who they are. And I think they can see that and they can feel that. And adults like 20 and 30 years older than me that I was a kid would just randomly tell me their life stories. Now I look back and I think that's deeply inappropriate. Um, 
but but I was always that person. And so I recognized that some aspect of my life was always going to be because I I cared that I had things to say that changed people's lives. And I could see it change people's lives and see it empower them to show up in really honest and vulnerable ways. And it changed their life and shifted things and relationships for them. Um, and, I, and I loved being able to help people. Um, so I, I knew there was always this aspect um, that was there, but I started my interior, I started my business as an interior design practice part-time. I had a full-time job in 2016. And I saw the way that my work transformed people's relationships because it wasn't, I didn't approach the project like, okay, you know, there's one person in the household who's deeply invested in this and we're going to go with what they want for this space. I would sit down and have a conversation with everyone who lived in that home, whether it be parents and kids or both, a, you know, couples, whatever it is, whoever it is. And, and, and say, how do you want to be able to show up in this space? What, what, what would you love to see here? And I would figure out a way to honor everybody's desire for that space as best as I could and create this really balanced, beautiful environment. And I saw the way that my interaction within these dynamics started to shift the way that people even spoke to each other. Um, and the way it allowed everybody to feel safe, seen and heard and understood. And so I understand fundamentally, that's what people want to know is that they're safe because they're seen, heard, understood and valued. And if I could create space that did that for everybody who lived there, that was really fantastic. And then in 2019, I took my business full time. Um, but I very quickly realized there was, like I said earlier, there was so much more that I wanted to be able to do and I didn't feel like I had permission to do it. Um, I thought I had to do it through interior design. I thought I was going to change the world through interior design. And then I realized, but I'm not really invested in consumer culture. I'm not really invested in encouraging people to replace all of their furniture. I don't, and, and, and I knew I wasn't because I don't charge. I even still, I do some interior design work. I don't charge an, um, uh, any fee on top of furniture that I purchase on behalf of my clients they get it for exactly what I purchased for. They just pay for my time, right? And so in setting up my pay structure that way, I was not invested in what they purchased. I was only invested in creating incredible spaces for them, right? Because I wasn't making any money off of what they purchased, only in the discussion around what to purchase. Um, and so I knew I was never going to make crazy money from being an interior designer because I just didn't care about that. And ultimately the shift came in recognizing that I've been doing research on what it is to be an intentional and ethical human. And then when started my own company specifically on what is it to be an intentional and ethical leader, because I didn't want to be the kind of person that I had ever worked for who were deeply exploitative and very harmful to me and didn't let me show up as myself and absolutely recognized that I was someone who was traumatized and used that to their advantage. Um, and so, you know, I, eventually I just got to the place where I was like, this, all this research and all this knowledge is taking up so much space inside of my head and inside of my person, inside of my being that I, I, I'm going to burst if I don't share it in more, in more significant ways. And I started getting asked for years, I've been asked to like come and speak at, you know, be a guest lecturer or come in and, and speak at, you know, uh, at events, so on and so forth. Um, but I hadn't ever like written a speech, but I felt completely comfortable in front of audiences because I'd spent time on, on stages from the time that I was a kid, dancing and performing and um, teaching drama and performing, uh, you know, acting, um, so on and so forth and, and singing. Uh, I used to lead worship at the church that I uh, grew up, the church slash cult that I grew up in. So like I, I knew how to perform, I knew how to be on a stage. Um, and so it just became this natural progression of using my voice as the medium, use being on a stage, being, you know, creating my workshops um, and being able to facilitate these incredible conversations um, became what I do now. Well, I love the, um, the concept of life by design. Um, is there anything, uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly big question uh, that I'm asking <laughs> and asking for some sort of summary, but have you got any, um, should we say, bullet points that you can share in terms of um, 
the difference between living your life by design versus I think what people mostly do, which is falling into one thing and then falling into the next thing. Have you got any thoughts there? Yeah, it it does take a little bit of extra mental space to take a pause and consider how you want to feel as you move through life, how you want other people to feel as they interact with you. However, it doesn't take any more action. Being intentional about how we show up is about just taking that pause and saying, what do I want to come of this moment? What is it that I want from this moment? And not only just thinking about it, but then vocalizing it to the people around you and continually setting those expectations and sharing those intentions, which is a deeply vulnerable thing. So it does take practice, right? And to learn to listen to our own voices. But ultimately what I find is that being intentional actually helps us to do less, right? And to stop saying yes to things we don't actually want to do and start feeling empowered to say no to the things we don't want to do so that we can show up better in the ways and things that we actually do want to do and be invested in. And so it's really talking about intention is about how we're investing ourselves and our energy and our time. What do we want to be investing it in and how? Um, and it's deeply important that we get curious. Um, and, and so I would just come back to the foundation of curiosity, respect, and accountability. And anything and everything we want to be good at, we have to practice. So this is not a all of a sudden you set an intention and it transforms your life. No, that's not how it works. Unfortunately, I wish, I wish there was a magic bullet. There isn't, <laughs> you know, um, it's more about taking that five minutes in the morning to meditate and ask yourself, how do you want to show up that day? Um, it's, it's more about, you know, taking that deep breath in and out and reminding yourself of your intention for the day, you know, as you move throughout the day. Um, and then, you know, having conversations with people before you enter moments together, right? Like before you go on vacation or before you go to an event, before you go to a dinner at your family's house, before, you know, just, setting these intentions, having these conversations so that we're truly in relationship with people. Because I think oftentimes we're so busy, we're just moving through the world and we're assuming that the people around us are aligned with what we want. And oftentimes they're not, right? Because we haven't asked, we don't even know. And that's where the conflict comes in. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no conflict in discussion around intentions. Um, but once we have those conversations, there's a lot less tension in our lives. And I've recognized how beautiful my relationships have become, the more intentional I have become with both myself and with the people I'm in relationship with. So, you know, I, I think that answers your question. I hope it does. I think it's a great point. Um, you, uh, you've alluded to um, unethical leadership. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people do know what that looks like. Um, but if you were to say... Um, a particular, particularly ethical leader, what that looks like. Uh, what's an example you might give? A leader who is not invested in their own, them specifically being the leader. There's no, in, in true leadership, there's no lonely leader at the top. There's a deep investment in community and mutual participation in leading, right? It's not just one person. It is all people's voices being seen, heard, and understood and valued, and then deciding how to move forward together, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that there, there isn't, you know, people who step up and, and use their voice a little bit more, but in leading group coaching for years, I recognized that there's a lot of people who have really brilliant ideas and would contribute to you know, a group being able to move forward in really beautiful and healthy ways, whether it be in an organization or it be, you know, any kind of group of people. Um, but, but their voices are kind of drowned out by everyone else's. When we create true democracy in community, when everyone's voices are heard and valued, um, it becomes a different thing. Now, there is a caveat there. <laughs> I don't think it's important. I think it's deeply important to shut down and absolutely not invest in 
people who have hateful, harmful, ideological, and um, just just deeply harmful opinions. If someone's hateful, racist, you know, sexist, those opinions do not get to be voiced. They do not get to be shared and empowered. We do not debate. I do not debate or engage in debate because the minute we engage in debate with people whose ideologies or ways of showing up in the world are hateful and dehumanizing and objectifying, we give it validity. So it is also really important that we not give space or voice to, to people who are hateful and harmful. Um, but we do need to give, you know, also recognize that the democratization of the sharing of information is a really beautiful and ethical way to move forward in leadership. Thank you for that. Um, can you tell me, um, is there any, should we say, type of person that you've you've noticed that comes to you and needs help? Is there anyone in particular that regularly comes to you with a particular problem? No. What What I love is that all people come to me. Like when I in my group coaching, I have worked with people from all over the world, every age, race, gender. Like, you know, well, not children, but as far as adults are concerned, are concerned. Um, and I love that about it. And I love facilitating those conversations between a broad variety of people. And the thing that I really loved um, is that when I first, and for the first two and a half years, now my group coaching has shifted and usually it's organizations that are hiring me to do group coaching. Um, but when I was, I had kind of open casting, like open call for, you know, anybody who wanted to be part of group coaching, it was almost split down the middle. 50% um, people who identified as men and 50% people who identified as women and every kind of ethnic or racial background. Um, and so it facilitated really important conversation. Um, and people who had some like kind of harmful ways of showing up were able to hear from other people and say, hey, because we all do, we all have harmful ways of showing up. Like that's the thing, <laughs> that's the thing at the bottom of, of it all. We can't in, grow up in this society and think that we come out clean, <laughs> we can't, right? And so in having those conversations, the way that it shifted so many people's understanding of the world around them um, was such an incredible thing and really renewed my faith in humanity. So again i hope that answers your question <laughs> have you got any um favorite examples you don't have to give details necessarily but um how you've helped someone yeah there's there's so many times when men have conversations with me particularly white men um and although i am critical of the patriarchy and critical of misogyny and men who are misogynist I also recognize that most men don't know how to show up in the world because they were never taught. They were taught to align themselves with masculinity, which is a concept that is ever changing and fundamentally dehumanizing. And so when men come to me, you know, they'll, they'll hear me be critical of patriarchy, of misogyny. And at first they think, I'm talking to and about them. And I'm like, you think that because you identify with some of the things I'm saying, I think you've participated in them, but that doesn't mean I think you're any less valuable. And it doesn't mean I think you're stuck being who you are. I think there are beautiful ways you can show up in the world and actually reconnect to your humanity and know that you are safe to be seen, heard and understood. Um, and the, the shift that I see when men recognize I actually deeply love men, but also don't feel safe around them, right? That, the, that those two things can be true at the same time. Um, that, that a man has to prove that I'm safe with him before I can, I can actually be in any kind of relationship with. Um, this shift when, when, when men see that is so valuable and the number of times that like I can see them holding back tears and I wish they didn't um but I can see that and I'm like okay you feel it now right and like let's now figure out how you can show up better in the world um and it 
dramatically shifts the relationships in our life. They go from someone who has people around them, but they are so lonely to someone who can actually figure out how to navigate the very weirdness that it is to be a human being in the world and figure out how to actually be in relationship with the people around them. And it's such an important and beautiful shift, like to see men be able to show up as human beings so that then they can also allow other people and empower other people to be full human beings around them as well, right? Because the patriarchy turns men into weapons against all people who are not men, right? And that is like that is fundamentally harmful. And so, to no for men to be divesting from that, to no longer be the weapon, is such a beautiful thing. And um, and I, you know, every time it happens, I'm my, it, my faith in humanity is deeply restored. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, if someone wants to hire you or get in touch, where do they go? My website is the best place. There is a tab on me as a speaker. There's also lots of free information there. There's a few videos. There's a free PDF on some tips on how to, you know, initiate designing your own life um, and some practices. There's also workshops available on my website. I believe in the democratization of information. And so through my website, I created a condensed version of both of my workshops. It's 45 minutes that has a Q&A and it comes with a 32, 33 page workbook. It includes a reading list, but also practices so that you can be invested in and in actually um, initiating these ideas into your life and incorporating them into your life um, in ways that feel aligned um, with your own thoughts, wants and desires for your own life. Um, and they're $40, $40 and $45 respectively. Um, so again, I try to make them as accessible as possible, um, for, you know, the everyday person who wants to invest in these concepts. That's all on my website, as well as my contact information. And my website is www.consonate.world. I'm sure it'll be tagged in the show notes. Um, but consonate is spelled C-O-N-C-I-N-N-A-T-E. Well, thank you for that. Have you got any closing thoughts for us today? Be curious. This investing curiosity, definitely Google something in the world today and every day that you think you know everything you need to know about just so that you can learn something new about it. And you'll start to absolutely recognize the ways in which everything around you is beautiful and valuable. It's a positive one to end on. Um, I appreciate you being um, sharing your story today uh, because I think it does help other people who have been in the same position so thank you and also thanks for being a great podcast guest yeah thank you thanks for having me i appreciate it